My name is Glenn Aubert. I'm the Director of Research Development and Innovation at Exacto. And I'm here today with Rodrigo Worley, the Extension Cropping Systems Weed Scientist at University of Wisconsin. Rodrigo, thanks for joining us today. Glenn, thank you. It's great to be here. Can you uh, give us a little background about yourself and uh, introduction? Absolutely. So I'm an assistant professor and also an Extension Weed Scientist here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, started our program here in January of 2018, so about four years now. Uh, the focus of our research and extension program goes around weed management in corn and soybean production systems. Excellent. Can you talk a little bit more about your program and, and some of the projects that you're working on and, and your students? Absolutely. Glenn. So I just want to take a, a quick step back here, uh, and I just want to kind of you know set the stage here. Uh, myself, our program here is a little different than most labs here on campus. Uh, most PIs uh, will have a research teaching appointment, so they're usually here in Madison. Uh, they conduct research, uh, they teach undergrads and graduate students. Uh, we don't have a teaching appointment here with the university. Our teaching appointment is through extension, so we work closely uh, with the industry, uh, consultants, and growers. So our job here at the university is to conduct applied research focus on weed management and corn and soybeans. And we work closely uh, with our ag industry, helping them fine tune their weed management practices. Regarding uh, the research that we're currently uh, working on, I think what's at the forefront right now is herbicide resistance. Uh, we have a program, we have a, a number of graduate students that are working on uh, documenting resistance, trying to understand the species that are evolving uh, different types of resistances to different Herbicides, water hemp or Amaranthus tuberculatus is the number one for us. However, we do a lot of work with chai and ragweed. Uh, we're working more and more with horseweed or also known as marestail. And we are starting to do more and more work with fall panicum, which is a, a grass species. Uh, used, it, it wasn't a, too big of a problem until recently. And now we're having more and more difficult time uh, controlling this one uh, grass species. So what we do, we bring seeds uh, from this various weed populations here at your greenhouses on campus and our students do a series of screenings looking at what's working and also what is not working so we can help our growers fine tune uh, their chemical weed control strategies. So resistance again is the number one. Uh, the second topic we're doing a lot of work on is on cover crops. Uh, there is a lot of interest in cover crops. Uh, a lot of people talking about carbon markets now and how cover crops may influence uh, such markets. Uh, but cover crops, you know, they with this whole soil health movement, uh, there's a lot more interest amongst our producers in establishing cover crops. Cover crops impact herbicides and herbicides also impact cover crops. So we're doing a lot of that research trying to understand uh, the interactions. For instance, some herbicides that have soil residual activity impact establishment of that cover crop. An excessive cover crop residue may impact how herbicide reaches its target, right? A soil surface or a weed. So we have a couple of graduate students that are working in those interactions. And lastly, uh, we're doing a lot of work on integrated weed management. Our herbicide or chemical options are becoming very, very limited, especially from a post-emergence uh, point of view. You're well aware of that. Uh, Glenn, you guys do a lot of uh, work on that arena. So we're doing a lot of work looking at integrated weed management strategies, starting from cover crops, uh, uh, looking at uh, targeted applications, uh, looking at uh, weed seed fate at the end of the season, either um, you know destroying them uh, with the seed destructor or accumulating them behind the, the combine through what we call a chaff lining so we can have more targeted uh, management. So a lot of work in that area as well. Well, thank you. Can you talk a little bit about the research process? You mentioned you know uh, bringing resistant seeds back into the greenhouse. So you, you observe something in the field, then you bring it back to the lab and, and do detailed work there. And then what does it look like taking that back out to the field in a, in a recommendation? Like uh, how soon you, will you have a recommendation that you can then bring back to the field? Uh, that's an excellent question. Usually we get those seeds and then the producers are waiting for the response for the next day. <laughs> that's how, how it usually goes. And we have to explain them as a little bit of a, a different process. For some weeds, you can simply collect leaf tissue and submit it to a lab and do a molecular test, right? So let's say I'm just gonna use water hemp here as an example. You can pull water hemp, water hemp leaves in season and you can send it to the University of Illinois. They already have established molecular tests for you. In two weeks, they'll tell you, 
whether that population contains the resistance or not. But when you're looking at these novel types of resistance where it hasn't been documented, there won't be a, a quick answer to that. So we usually take uh, this weed seeds back. Uh, we need to put this, uh, you know, usually we put the seeds in the freezer for a period of time so we can lower the, the dormancy. So here's the catch about weeds and you know this, Glenn, sometimes you wanna grow them uh, in the greenhouse, they just don't grow. So you gotta break dormancy. It, it sometimes is a very, very challenging process. So it takes about a couple months to break dormancy of the seeds. Then you gotta start the plants. You gotta replicate the studies. You gotta let those plants grow for three to four weeks, spray, collect your data. Uh, three, four weeks later, replicate the study multiple times. So it can be easily a, a five, six month process. So usually we get seeds in the fall and then we try to get the studies done and accomplished by the next spring. So then we can get the reports out to the grower and the growers can fine tune uh, what they're gonna be using in regards to you know, chemical weed control in that sense. And then what we do, we work closely with the commodity boards uh, especially here in the state of Wisconsin, uh, where we're funded by them. Uh, we work closely uh, with the producers that are, you know, members uh, of the board. Uh, we have uh, the ability to connect with them directly. They send us samples. And then we not only make the data available to those producers who sent us the samples, but we also make it available to the entire state through our blog, social media, listservs, and so on. So all farmers can be aware of what's happening around the state. Maybe they might not be dealing with resistance quite yet, but they, you know, that way they become aware of what might be coming uh, their way. That's such a, a great service that Extension provides back to the to industry and to the growers. Uh, so what, what do you do then if you, uh, you check for resistance and then you confirm that that, that is the case, then what kind of recommendation then could, could you make back to the grower? How do they change their practice after that? Yeah, so first, once that resistance is confirmed, what we try to do, we looked at alternative uh, chemical options in the greenhouse where we'd spray at a standard field rate and see how those are doing. So we provide the report confirming or not resistance and also how that population is responding to alternative herbicides you could be using either that year, you know, in that crop where you're struggling with or in rotational years. So I just wanna get back to this fall panicum example. So this fall panicum population, we have recently confirmed resistance to nicosuferon, okay, which is an ALS herbicide. Uh, why is that a problem? Because that's coming from sweet corn production. So for control of grasses, post-emergence and sweet corn, nicosuferon is the main herbicide that's available for those producers. So once you lose that tool, it becomes difficult. So we looked at alternative herbicides such as the HPPD chemistry, right? Your uh, mesotrion, isoxaflutol and, and some other options. And those herbicides did not provide effective control. The herbicides that really worked on that populations are herbicides that you could use in a subsequent year, such as uh, in alfalfa or uh, in soybeans, where you could either use glyphosate, clatodem, and some other examples right there. So it goes back to, okay, we're providing recommendations in regards to what chemistry can be used, but also trying to promote, look, you got to rotate your crops. And when you rotate those crops, you got to take advantage of what's available in that rotational year. So that way you can manage this problem you're having. That makes sense. So you talked a lot about the challenges that growers are, are facing and then how, you know, university extension supports that and provides information. I think a third piece of all that is, is industry, um, you know, seed and then and chemical as well. Uh, what do you have any specific thoughts around what industry could be working on to to help growers? And uh, it's kind of an open ended question, but anything. specific? Yeah. No, that's an excellent question. Uh, I think that's the I think that's industry main goal every day, right? As part of their business, there is to help growers uh, come up with uh, new solutions. Uh, we're fortunate, I you know I keep mentioning that we're working closely with grad students. We're working closely uh, with farmers. We work a lot with industry. Uh, our program is funded by industry. We looked at chemical portfolios. We looked at we look at alternative strategies. Always uh, working with industries uh, there because. I think it's a two-way street, Glenn, where you know growers are asking us about products that industry is coming up with, uh, and we all have we know that chemical options are somewhat limited. So we're you know always working closely uh, with industry there, and our recommendations oftentimes align uh, quite well. So it's a, it's a great uh, partnership uh, that way. Because back in the day, universities were coming up with strategies, right, with chemical options, uh, with tolerance rates, and that that's not the case anymore. So it's important for us to stay relevant that we work closely with industry because you all uh, are coming up with, with the innovations uh, out there. 
So that is the the one thing. Can you rephrase the main question now, Glenn? Yeah. So looking forward, uh, do, you, do you see additional opportunities, uh, ways the industry can engage with extension and with growers to help solve those challenges directly? Yeah. So I think the, the main challenge is right now, the first one we talked about already is resistance. And we're starting to deal more and more with these extreme weather events, uh, right? So our springs like this, this 2021 growing season, it was abnormally dry for us here in Wisconsin. I've been here four years and it was it was quite of a challenging year because our farmers were spraying their pre-herbicides, but then we didn't have rainfall for activation, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas in the in 19, we had the extreme where it wouldn't stop uh, raining. So we have this, you know, these extreme weather events which make uh, weed control and establishing a crop very, very challenging. Um, so we have resistance, extreme weather events, so it's not getting any easier. Moreover, if you look at the herbicides that are available to us, um, you know, we haven't had new chemistry or new sites of action come into the marketplace now for corn and soybean growers and, and growers of other crops for more than 30 years now. So we have very limited chemical options. We have resistance out there. And then we have these extreme weather events. So I think more than ever working, you know, farmers, industry, uh, academics working together to try to come up with management strategies for these challenges that we have is, is going to be very very important, especially if we continue on with this, what I like to call simplistic rotations, where you have corn, soybeans, corn, soybeans, you have mm. crops that are being planted and established at the same time. I think we got to do something in the middle, whether there's room for a, a novel crop, uh, it's unknown. Uh, and that's why I think I like this idea of cover cropping, because you break the cycle of the weeds. We usually say that the best uh, control option for weeds is dark, right? So if you have crop canopy, out there, if you have dark out there, if you're, we would like to say promote darkness in your rotations, right? Because if you're doing that, you're effectively uh, suppressing those weeds. And that's why we like this cover crops bringing, you know, that zero rye or whatever it is in that fallow period between your crop harvest and the establishment of the next crop. Uh, we've done some really neat work looking at what we call planting soybean green, where you come on top of your rye and and you plant it and you terminate it later uh, once you have enough biomass, because not only that biomass is suppressing weed early in the in the season, but if you have a nice dense mat of a cover crop there, and if you combine that with a pre herbicide, you do a tremendous job at suppressing primarily small seeded weeds such as water hemp and uh, lamp squirters, which are big problems for our growers out there. So tremendous opportunities, Glenn. If you look back 20 years ago, uh, when you know. Glyphosate became a thing, Roundup Ready crops, and we changed from heavy tillage to no till. That was a big revolution back, back then. Mm -hmm. The question that goes through my mind, what's the next one, right? Because we're mm -hmm. at that point right now. We need to do something new because we have all these challenges that we just mentioned here. Yeah, absolutely. It's a good perspective. Um, so every discussion about herbicides in the past several years, dicamba always comes up, right? And so um, we've obviously been all working on that uh, as an industry. Um, can you talk about uh, work you, you guys have done with dicamba? Um, anything specific here in Wisconsin? Yeah, no, absolutely. We When I started here, uh, it was 2018, was the second year that the, you know, the technology and the herbicides were fully approved for over the top. And at that time, I started uh, working closely uh, with several uh, academics around the country, but also with Bayer Crop Science at that point where we were doing a lot of research uh, looking at off-target movement. So mm -hmm. we've done a lot of these large scale trials we did in 18, 19, 2020, where we have a four acre block, uh, excuse me, an eight acre block that we spray. And then we evaluate the fate of that herbicide uh, in the air uh, and the symptomology or injury that it causes in the surrounding soybeans. So we had a, a experiments that were 30, 40 acres in size. So we did some massive studies there understanding at off-target movement. We did a lot of what we call uh, the low tunnel uh, volatility trials starting in 18, uh, you know, the past four years where we looked at tank mix combinations, uh, novel formulations, and then more recently, the volatility reducing agents, which I, I'm aware um, you guys have also done some work on and you also have mm -hmm. your own uh, product there. So we were able to test firsthand uh, in our research plots, you know, the impact that some of this uh, adjuvants and formulations had, uh, especially in volatility in that sense, because that has been at the forefront as a major um, 
concerned. So that has been a tremendous opportunity for us. It has kept us, you know, our group really, really, really busy because the, those, those types of uh, research projects are very, very time consuming, but it was, it's been very rewarding to be part of it. We've learned a lot. Uh, so I just want to do like a quick step by step if that works here. I wasn't part of the major group in 2017 because I wasn't acting as a weed scientist yet. But in 17, they learned that AMS, you know, adding AMS in the tank with Clive or dicamba, excuse me, highly increased the volatility potential, right? In 2018, we learned that the, the formulation of glyphosate could impact uh, volatility. And when I say we, we're talking about academics and industry kind of working together. So if you had the wrong uh, formulation, if you have an ammonia-based formulation of glyphosate, that was enough to increase volatility. And that's why you can only use the potassium salts of glyphosate when tank mixing. Uh, with the dicamba products that are registered for use in soybeans. And then the 2020, uh, 2021 seasons, we focus more on the volatility reducing agents, uh, potassium acetate uh, as the main active ingredient. Uh, and that has shown tremendous impact in reducing uh, dicamba volatility. So it's been a very rewarding process. And then what has happened uh, more recently is the use of hooded sprayers, okay? And that's gonna impact dicamba, but it's not only impacting dicamba as you pay attention to the news with EPAs here, there are some other herbicides that are of concern. So we do believe the use of a hooded sprayer, especially where you have areas where endangered weed species are present may become a thing. So we've done a series of drift trials uh, looking at how hooded sprayers can help minimize uh, off-target movement. And what we've learned is that by using these hooded sprayers, you can substantially decrease uh, pesticide drift during uh, applications. So it's been very rewarding that way. That's great. Thank you for that, that perspective. Yeah, we have been very involved uh, from an adjuvant standpoint. Uh, all these new challenges creates lots of uh, diverse, uh, diverse challenges in terms of uh, many products going in one tank and uh, many different appro approaches required. So um, in general, what, how much work do you do with adjuvants or um, what kind of research questions do you think would be useful for growers related to, to adjuvants and things that we can do, um, not just in the, what's in the, the, the herbicide and what's happening with the seed trait, but the, uh, getting that extra 10% of control that, you know, to ensure a good application. That's a fantastic question there. Uh, Glenn, we, we do a lot of, you know, looking at herbicides and usually we just use whatever standard recommendation by that company is when it comes down uh, to adjuvants. And adjuvants is an area I wish we would do a little more work on, to be honest with you. We don't do a whole lot of work. Uh, the main area we've focused uh, in regards to adjuvants has been around the volatility uh, mm -hmm. reducing agents. We have done some additional work looking at uh, so how some of these adjuvants enhance uh, control some of the tough weeds that we have out there when it comes down to herbicide. Uh, uptake and translocation. I'm talking here primarily velvet leaf and lamb squirters, but we have not done uh, enough, I don't think. Uh, some years ago, we had a lot more academics that were heavily involved in adjuvant research. Uh, I think that has changed a little bit over this past couple of years with some folks changing positions and, and some retirements. So I think that's an opportunity uh, out there. The other thing is this past couple of weeks here, I've been getting a lot of questions with the because of prices, uh, you know, herbicide prices, herbicide shortages, I think 2022 is going to be a crucial year for the appropriate adjuvant selection. I don't think we usually take them for granted. Um, and I don't know if I'm accurate in my statement here or not. I don't think we pay as close attention to the adjuvants as we should. Okay. Uh, but mm -hmm. coming 2022, where we're going to have shortages, where we're going to be maybe reducing the rates of the herbicides that we use, I think adjuvants will become even more important because, you know, to help us not only enhance uh, performance there, you know, but mm -hmm. enhanced performance when we have in this tight scenario of uh, a chemical supply. And then I go back to resistance here, Glenn, we've done some greenhouse work. Uh, and then just by accident, one time we left the adjuvant out of the experiment and we went straight to the active ingredient. We then replicated the study with the adjuvant and the differences were day and night. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's, mm -hmm. we're constantly, and I like to talk about glufosinate uh, a lot. Glufosinate is a very sensitive herbicide. So using the right Adjuvants can make a difference. PPO herbicides, your fomazofen, uh, your flax star, you know, flax star fomazofen or cobra lactofen. There's a lot more use of those herbicides out there. They're contact products. So assuring that when they're hitting, hitting the target, uh, that they are, you know, 
you know, the plant is uptaking those herbicides properly, uh, I think is key. And I think adjuvants can play a huge role. So there is, you know, the adjuvants when we were talking about drift, you know, the help us make sure the herbicides stay on target, but there's also the importance of making sure the herbicides get into the site of action within that plant, um, especially where, you know, options are very limited. We got to get the most of what we have available and adjuvants I think can help us. And the last comment I want to make, uh, and I don't know what your thoughts are on that, and I don't mean to put you on the spot here, but we're talking more and more about mm -hmm. uh, metabolic resistance, right? That is continuing to evolve in our weeds out there. How can adjuvants help overcome some of that, right? And this is kind of a question that we have at forefront. I have a PhD student that's starting here now, and he's highly interested in doing uh, some of that work. How can we use some of this adjuvants? What can we be using to revert a little bit of this resistance and make sure that our herbicides continue to perform as they have? Yeah, it's a really open-ended question without an easy answer. Um, and there's all different reasons for um, why tank mixes don't work well, right? There, there can be physical incompatibility. There can also be chemical incompatibility. That chemistry can be happening in the tank or it can be happening in the plant. And so I think your point about, you know, in the past, the, the thought that an NIS is NIS and a, a COC is a COC and just kind of over simplifying the, the offerings. Uh, I think we're at the tip of the iceberg and understanding um, the, the biochemistry that we can impact by um, specializing something that might still be a non-ionic surfactant, but there are many different ways to approach that chemistry. And so a lot of our research has been into, um, you know, optimizing specific tank mixes such as um, dicamba and clethidin, where you see antagonism of those two materials. But with, with certain um, in-can adjuvant approaches, we have better compatibility of those materials and we overcome that resistance in some cases. So it's, uh, I don't think it's a quick, easy answer, but I think uh, it's just back to our earlier discussion. It's gonna require the, the close connection with growers to understand what are these new emerging problems because they're coming up so fast. It's gonna require the engagement with Extension and University who's you know right there at the ground level to help with those problems. And then an industry has to be tied in with that because a lot of the herbicide labels and recommendations at the retail level are coming from industry. And so that, that just that close collaboration, I think is gonna be the key to moving forward in general. So that's our perspective. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about, you, you mentioned glufosinate and um, we're seeing more and more seed trait stacks that are coming together and glufosinate is something we, we look towards in the future. Um, do, you, do you guys do much research with glufosinate and how do you see that evolving in the future? Yeah, no, just like you mentioned, I mean, if you look at the major traits in our uh, soybean portfolio here, it's, it's part of it. It's part of the LGT27. It's, gonna, it's part of the Enlist and now it's, it's part of the Extend Flex. Um, and when we do our resistance screenings here that I was talking about earlier on, Glufosinate so far is the one herbicide, the one and only herbicide that we test in our screenings that have that has provided 100% control of all water hemp plants. So we've tested several populations from all over uh, the state of Wisconsin. We have also tested it on multiple uh, horseweed and uh, giant ragweed. So in the greenhouse conditions, when you're spraying everything by the book under perfect conditions, the one herbicide that provide 100% mortality of all, all weeds. With all that said, there's going to be a lot of uh, selection pressure, I believe, on glufosinate. Uh, and not only that, when you take glufosinate out of the field, to the field, you don't always get this 100% control. Uh, as you well know, as a contact herbicide, coverage matters, uh, time of the day matters, nozzle selection, carrier rate, whatever you have, everything impacts efficacy. So what we've been doing some work on now is trying to understand what are the main factors that are impacting glufosinate. Uh, we're doing some field research. We're also uh, conducting, as we speak right now, a large survey with growers to understand how are they spraying glufosinate in their soybeans and, you know, what and how well it's working for them. So through the survey, uh, we want to understand, you know, how is this chemistry being used? One thing that I want to share with you, some preliminary information here, is that e a good third of the respondents there indicate so far that they don't even know which nozzle they've been using. So there's a lot of opportunities for us, again, as an industry, as extension, uh, to help uh, 
our applicators and also our growers better understand that if you're going to be using this herbicide, you better know what you're doing there. And then uh, a final comment about glufosinate. Um, some work that we're doing now is looking at potential interactions between glufosinate and some other herbicides. Uh, so this tank mix of glufosinate and 2,4-D choline and then list soybeans is being promoted out there. We've done some work. We've seen some uh, increased efficacy when the two herbicides are combined versus spraying them alone. But we're also looking at uh, glufosinate tank mix with PPO herbicides. Uh, there's been some work uh, that was conducted by a colleague, by colleagues at Colorado State University. Uh, you've probably seen some of that work, Glenn, where they, where they uh, sprayed the two herbicides together, they observed a synergistic effect in the greenhouse environment. Uh, they've done some molecular studies, some very amazing findings there uh, by our colleagues at Colorado State University. So what we decided to do, we took that idea to the field and then we had four PPO herbicides uh, that we tested. We tested Flexstar, Cobra, uh, we tested Cadet and Resource, and then we tank you mix them with uh, glufosinate. And every time we tank mix glufosinate with the PPO, we always observed enhanced control. We've done this research at multiple sites, couple states here and in Illinois. Uh, so here's an option for folks that are either in an LGT27 or if they're in an extend flex soybean system where they don't wanna use dicamba, and they need something else to enhance that, let's say water hemp control post-emergence, you know, this potential tank mixes with the PPO and glufosinate uh, can be uh, of use uh, to those producers as well. But the, the long story short here, uh, the timing has a tremendous impact. If once you spray those weeds, once those weeds are well-established, it's nearly impossible to control them. So back to the spraying them uh, when they're very small, uh, otherwise control just won't be uh, as good. Got it. So I'm kind of wrapping up here. Right now it's November of 2021. If we were having this talk in November of 2031, so 10 years from now, uh, what do you think we'd be talking about? <laughs> That's phenomenal. So one of the new areas that we're working on now, it's this uh, smart sprayers. Uh, we're working with one of the companies that uh, is at the forefront of one of those technologies. We're going to start to do some field research uh, next year. So maybe 10 years from now, I think this is kind of, you know, where we're going to be, you know, we're going to be delivering our chemicals uh, where the weeds are. Uh, and 10 years from now, it might be more than chemicals because, you know, we don't know what the, it, it's quite uncertain what the future of chemicals will be like in 10 years uh, from now. Uh, as I said, we haven't seen new sites of action. We don't know what are new sites of action. Uh, we will not become available. There are some herbicides coming down the pipeline, but as far as I'm concerned, most of them are pre-emerged herbicides. So I think this uh, post-emergence weed control uh, will be quite different 10 years from now. Maybe we're going to be more targeted. Uh, maybe we're going to be talking a lot more uh, adjuvants, you know, different types of adjuvants that can enhance uh, performance, uh, smart sprayers where, you're, again, we're only spraying uh, where the weeds are. I think we have this pressure right now uh, from the general public, uh, minimize uh, chemical use, so being more strategic how we spray. I think this is probably what we're going to be talking 10 years from now, Glenn, I think. One thing that will be the same is we still have the weeds. We still have the same agronomic problems, right? Just new soil. Yes. yes. And then, yes. And then I think one thing that's important uh, to talk about here over this past 30 years, I mean, I think we've done a very fine job selecting uh, the finest of the finest. So if you look at the weeds that are current problems, okay, they're very difficult weeds and they will continue uh, to evolve and adapt, not only to the herbicides, but to the practices that we are uh, implementing. Some weeds are now emerging later, so then they skip that early season tillage. Some weeds have extended emergence windows, so they skip either that pre-emerge application or they you know, are not exposed to the post herbicide window. So it's just amazing how fast those weeds are evolving. And that's because we already selected the best of the best out there or the worst of the worst, depend, depends how you uh, look at it. So yeah, so I think there's it's a great times to be in weed science and that's all I'm going to say right yeah. now. It's been very yeah. challenging, but very, very exciting from a researcher perspective. Absolutely. We share that same sentiment. It's, uh, it's exciting. Yes. Well, and, thank you, know, you very our, much. What's that? No, I was just going to say our growers uh, need all the tools that are available uh, mm -hmm. and they're going to continue to come uh, from industry, uh, from from university. So we all need to, to keep collaborating and helping our growers because at the end of the day, I think that's our uh, you know, that's our mission from all of us. We feel the same. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us. It was great to hear about your program and 
Uh, thanks. Thanks for your time. Thanks for the opportunity, Glenn. Uh, if folks are interested in learning more about our program, they can always check our website, uh, whiskweeds.info. Everything we do is posted there. So. Great. Thank you. Thank you.